my. She's too cute to be that mean, right? Well, hey guys, more, good morning, good welcome, welcome to Life One. If you're new, my name is Kelly, and I am uh, one of the pastors here, and I'm so glad that you're here today. Today, we're kicking off a brand new series, Horns and Halos, where we are going to look at this cosmic battle of good and evil that's all around us, the role of angels and demons in our lives, and ultimately, I want you to see how you can win in the end. This is something that we all deal with, we all struggle with, and we're going to dive into it. We're going to look at what Scripture actually says, and so here's uh, all this series, I think this is true, but particularly for this one, um, particularly if you have questions and you're, and you're kind of wondering some things, but this is one of those series that you really need to be here for, for all of them. If you can't be here, you need to jump online and catch it on the podcast uh, because there's some, some powerful stuff that you're going to need for your life. You're going to need to kind of h- hold on to when, when difficult times are coming because the reality is, is that we all have to face and deal with uh, the, this, this evil this, in, in our spiritual world that, that we struggle against. Uh, there was a, a young couple, they were Christians. Uh, they were dedicated to getting themselves in a better spot financially, so they were completely on the Dave Ramsey plan. I mean, they were working it every step, paying off all the debt. They were really on a tight budget. They were pinching every penny, and, and honestly, it was the wife that was kind of leading the charge. I mean, she was the one that was all the time telling him, no, you can't, you can't do this, you can't do that, and, and we've got to really save. And so it was rice and beans and beans and rice every day, and they were, they were slowly working themselves out of debt into a, a stronger place financially, and then then one day, as she's going around and she's 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 trying to she's trying to you know get some things that the family needs, she sees something in the store that she's been looking for for so long. It was the perfect dress, is the right color, the right length. I mean, everything about it was absolutely perfect. And she she thought, well, nothing will hurt if I just try it on. So she went and she tried it on, and it fit just it fit her body perfectly. It just made everything look right. She 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 loved it. And so even though it was it was so far beyond her budget, she she just went ahead and she bought it. She blew the budget. And when her husband got home, she goes, honey, I've got to tell you about this dress I bought today. It's perfect, but it, it, it caused me to blow the budget. And then she showed him how much she spent, and he was what? He couldn't believe it. She goes, what, what are you thinking? Why, why didn't you Why didn't you call? me why didn't you we, we have an agreement about spending this kind of money on such a thing as, as this dress and she goes I know honey but it's the perfect dress and she goes well why did you buy it and she she finally says well the devil made me do it and her husband said well you should, you should have said get thee behind me Satan she goes I didn't he said it looks great from the back <laughs> we all have to face temptation in life um And I don't mean to make light of things that need to come out of the dark, but the reality is is that that we that we deal with these things. And, and we need a strong biblical perspective to, to think about this huge issue. It's an issue that's been around for a long time. In fact, since the dawn of mankind. But it's it's been pretty pervasive in many other ways. May 2, 1941, as the world was at war, a young professor was writing letters and he was writing in a way to try to help people conceive and think about the spiritual battle that was also going on as the atrocities that were being important in the news were far less revolting than the atrocities that had not come to light yet. And as he is writing these letters in the Guardian newspaper, he, he writes and he tries to write from a perspective that, that would help us to conceive and think about the way evil forces might work in our lives and the way that good forces might work in our lives to steer us towards the best. And in that climate, C.S. Lewis wrote what has become known as the Screwtape Letters. If you haven't read the Screwtape Letters, I can't recommend it enough. It is probably uh, perhaps the, the best Christian fiction work on uh, the supernatural that, uh, that you'll ever read. Um, it's very well known. But he speaks of this topic concerning angels and demons. And, and some of the things that he says makes so much sense. But, but one thing in particular that I want us to kind of keep in mind as we kind of begin to frame this discussion. He says this. There are two equal and opposite errors into which our race can fall about the devils. One is to disbelieve in their existence. The other is to believe and feel an excessive and unhealthy interest in them. They themselves are equally pleased by both errors and hail a materialist or a magician with the same delight. So there are basically two miles of ditch for every mile of road. And it's so easy to fall into a ditch. And what we want to do is to take a biblical and a scriptural perspective, a healthy perspective on what God is calling us to as we understand what's going on here. I have friends on both sides of this thing, as you can imagine. I have people, friends who, who love Jesus deeply, 
They, they love the, the, the institute of faith that, that, that is called the church. Uh, and, and they believe, though, as they have looked at their faith and they look at Scripture, they have perhaps uh, taken things and, and maybe over-intellectualized them in some ways. They see the evil that goes on within the human heart and the things that happen on a regular basis. And, and what they see going on there is it's evil enough. That we don't need any help from the demons, we don't need any help from the devil, that, that mankind, humankind itself is evil enough, we don't have to have someone supernatural that we can't see to blame it on. So there's a bunch of people, a, a huge group of people who love Jesus, who are just as de dedicated and devoted as anybody else, but that's their perspective. And there's another group of people who are absolutely in love with the gospel. They're, they're so dedicated to what God has done in their life. They have been powerfully transformed, and they, and they see this work that, that God has done. And it's been this powerful thing, and, and yet they, they take a different perspective. For the first group, for them, the problem's always in us. It doesn't have to be a devil or demons because we're evil enough on our, on our own. But the second group of people... When they face temptation, when they struggle with addiction, when they find themselves dealing with sin, it's difficult for them to take responsibility. For them, it has to be the work of the devil. It has to be demons on the prowl. For them, the problem is always out there because of the work of, that Jesus has done in here to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And so there's two equal and opposite errors. But what I want to make perfectly clear for us is that it's actually a little bit of both. There's forces against us, and we have to face our own weakness. But the good news is that God leads us to victory. I want you to understand something, particularly if you came today and you haven't made a decision for Christ. This is, this is such an important thing for you to understand, is that God is always working for us. God is always moving things around in our life to bring us to a, a greater place of faith, to a, to a deeper uh, level of joy and a deeper level of peace. God is always working for us. God is trying and working in our heart to steer us down the path of, of victory. That's what God wants for us. See, even if you're running as hard as you can in the wrong direction, God is there working to bring you in, working hard to bring you home. You are the apple of his eye. And no matter what you may have heard before, no matter how you may feel, no matter what you have done, God loves you, he wants you, and he's working right now to guide you to his very best. You are the treasure of God's heart. I hope you know that. I want you to know that. You need to know that because you're so valuable to him that someone else wants you too, and he plays dirty. He has no respect for you. He has no respect for your family. He, he, he really doesn't want good things for you at all, although he may sometimes seem to want to tempt you into things that, that certainly look like good things. But Jesus spoke very specifically and very plainly to this issue. Uh, and in fact, Jesus, as, as often he was often willing to do and able to do, he spoke so plainly that it's pretty hard to, 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 to get confused here. He says this. He says, For the thief has come. To steal, kill, and destroy. But I have come that they might have life and have it to the full. He was talking about the thief, this enemy of our soul, that, that he came and this is his purpose. It's the whole reason he's here, the, 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 whole, the whole point. He's here to steal, kill, and destroy. So he kind of frames the battle for us. There's one side that's for your destruction, bent on no good. But I am here that you might have life. And not just have existence. You know, there's this thing that we can do. We can kind of live. We can kind of breathe. We can respirate. Our hearts can pump blood through our bodies. We can exist or we can live. And Jesus says, I can that you might have life and have it to the full more abundantly. That's what Jesus has called us to. That's what he wants for us. Jesus doesn't dance around the issue. He's talking about the cosmic battle for the soul of mankind. Which side are you on? It's a powerful question. We're going to spend the rest of October looking into this, but, but today I'm going, to, I'm, and I'm going to kind of try to, to get, get, kind of start with the battle around us. I'm going to tell some stories I've had from my own experience. We're going to have a lot of fun in this series, but for us to get any traction on where we need to go with this, we need to understand and, and, and answer a few questions. And here's perhaps the first, one of the most common questions that I get when we start talking about these things, and it's this. Do angels and demons really exist? Is that really a thing? Do angels and demons really exist? Is that really a thing? And like I said, there's, there's different ideas and different groups on both sides of this issue. 
Now, a lot of times when we start having this question, we think of something like this, and maybe you saw this, this artwork, um, that picture. <laughs> that is, that's like every day in the office with Nate. He's just having this constant battle. But when we think of angels and demons in this way, it's hard to really think of them as, as these powerful beings that we're going to examine in the next few weeks. And it's, it's hard for, for us to think of them either as a rescuer or as someone who can tear you apart. It, it seems like there's someone that you can you know, kind of punt to the middle of nowhere with your fingertips, right? I mean, they just don't seem like they're that substantial. But this is a cartoonish version of what this is. And so we're going to look at in the next few weeks, you know, what do angels look like? What do demons look like? What, what, what is that? We're going to answer some, some big questions. And in fact, if you have any specific questions about angels and demons that you want to have answered the next few weeks, just put this down. Kelly at lifepointlebanon.com, send me an email and we'll answer those for you. We'll, we'll get them answered. Even if they're really crazy and bizarre, we'll get them answered. I promise we will find a way to find an answer for your question. Now, if this, though, is what angels and demons look like, and this is what they are, then, then it's really hard for us to believe anything decent about it at all. And so I don't believe that's where we want to necessarily start. What I want to start with is, is, is to, to root our uh, expectations and our understandings in Scripture. And this is why this is so important. Because if you're looking for profound, indisputable physical evidence, you're not going to find a lot. But Scripture does give us a, an incredible amount of insight into the role of angels and demons in our lives. And, and I want to begin with the premise that God can be trusted. God's word can be trusted. Uh, there's plenty of people out there that have done all kinds of things to try, to try to take the credibility away from God's word. They might say it's a great book of antiquity, but they'll talk about it being full of errors and things like that. But I want to, I want to show you a few verses that don't necessarily have to do with anything with angels and demons, but they, they give us a reason to kind of rethink some of those things. They give us a reason to believe and to trust that we can actually believe in the Word of God. Now, and here's the first one we're going to look at. It comes to us from the book of Job. Now, I want you to understand, before it comes up there, before we read this, that the book of Job is considered by scholars outside the Christian world, within the Christian world. It's, it's kind of unanimous. It is one of the oldest written works in all of human antiquity. Outside the Jewish faith, outside the Christian faith, people, all of us, the book of Job is considered one of the oldest and earliest works. Okay? Now, with that in mind, it was written before Galileo invented the telescope. It was written before we could gaze into the stars and have any idea of what was actually going on in space. It was certainly written way before we sent men into space to have a look at what was going on around us. But listen to what the book of Job says he says this, God stretches the northern sky over empty space and hangs the earth on nothing. Now, this might not be that impressive to you, but you have to understand, in the day and time when Job was written, other cultures said things like the earth existed on the back of a giant terrapin, big turtle. Other people believe that, that, that really there was no, no earth or space that was out there, but there was just layers. So there was the heavens, and then there was the, the terra firma, the earth, and then there was the underworld below. And that's how they saw the world, this cross-section, kind of like lasagna, just a big, nasty lasagna. <laughs> but yet Job, thousands of years before science proved it was true, was telling us, God's word was telling us that the earth hangs on nothing. That, that, that's powerful to me. I hope it's powerful to you to see that, that God's word was speaking to things and confirming things and telling us truths that we wouldn't discover for, for, for thousands of years. And yet, after we find them, they're here today. Here's another one. It doesn't only happen in the Old Testament. Check this out in the book of Hebrews. It says, by faith we understand that the entire universe was formed at God's command, that what we see did not come from anything that can be seen. Now, again, this is the New Testament. So, so we're not looking at Job in the oldest book. We're looking at a book that's a little bit newer, uh, one of the later books written in the New Testament. But check this out. It's still thousands of years old. In the realm of science, the understanding that all matter consists of electrons and protons and neurons is a fairly new idea. Fairly new idea. I mean, we know it now because it's, it's taught in our science classes. We, we, you know, we have these big hadron colliders. I mean, we, we have science that tells us and has told us you know, for, for as long as any of us have been living that this is the reality of the world. It's, it's created by these little tiny particles that we cannot see. We did not come from anything that can be seen. It was written 
thousands of years before these discoveries. And so for all you people out there that believe the Bible's unreliable, how do you explain that? They just got lucky? Is that, is that how we explain it? Really? I think if we're going to be intellectually honest, we have to realize that God's word is God's truth. That God has, has, has given us his word and it's a guide and something that we can trust. And so as we move forward, there, there's some powerful information that can guide us in this, in this walk called life. And so as we look at the Bible, I believe it's something we can trust as we look at what, what is true and what's not true about angels and demons. We have to look at Scripture and know that it can be trusted. And here is a great place for us to start. It's Ephesians chapter 6. Now, in the book of Ephesians, Paul is, is writing to this church in Ephesus, and he spends the first few chapters. It's, it's one of my favorite books. I talk about it a lot. But it's, he spends the first few chapters talking about who we are in him. It's a powerful study where, where Paul outlines who you are, and he, he just kind of gives us these promises, and he makes these statements that apply to every believer, and it's, it's so good. It's so good. And then he jumps into, uh, after chapter 3, he jumps into verse, chapter 4 and chapter 5, and he starts talking about how we're to live these lives for, for God. And he talks about specifically how to live in relationship with one another. And it talks about specifically in the church and in the public square how, how, to, how, to, how to live within marriages and how children are to relate to their parents and, and how we're to be in the workplace. And as Paul is writing these very, very powerful, powerful uh, instructions on how to live the Christian life, before he finishes, he says this in chapter 6. He says, and a final word, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on all of God's armor so that you'll be able to stand firm against all the strategies of the devil. For we're not fighting against flesh and blood enemies, but against rulers, evil rulers and authorities of the unseen world, against mighty powers in this dark world and against evil spirits in healthy or in heavenly places. So as we look at what's going on here in Ephesians 6, let's kind of break this down a little bit. Let's, let's start with a dose of reality. I love that he starts with something that we can powerfully understand. He says this, be strong in the Lord and his mighty power. He's talking to us about this, this spiritual battle. He's talking to us about this, this final thing. He's like, you know, this is the way you live. That's stuff you can do in your own power, in your own strength. You have to make the choice to treat people right. You have to make the choice to, to, be, to forgive, to be honest, to not tell lies, to live rightfully. You have to make that choice. But then he says this, but one final word. There's this cosmic battle going on. And you're going to face evil spirits and evil forces and powers in an unseen world, something you can't understand, and they are battling for you and against you. You need to protect yourself, but if you're going to do anything at all, this is what you need to do first. You need to be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. You need to be strong in him first. This is another reason why I trust the Bible. So many other religions drive us to a place where we can believe in what we can do. And I believe that we have enough strength on our own. If you just look within yourself, you're going to be able to do anything you want to do. But the Bible doesn't say that. The Bible says, hold on, man. You need, to, you need to check yourself before you wreck yourself. Because if you're going to have strength here, if you're going to have victory here, it won't be because you're so powerful. It will be because he is so powerful. Be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. See, God wants us to live a life that, that, that is full of power. He wants us to do the things that we can do. We make the choice to love people. We make the choice to live the lives that he has called us to. You can live that kind of life, and it's, and it's a powerful thing. But, but there's a difference between plugging into a, a, an outlet and, and having a double-A battery, right? Whenever I was a youth pastor in Kansas City, I took about 200 teenagers to Juarez, Mexico, to build houses for very, very poor people. And uh, I don't think you could go to that area again, not, at least not right now. But we went down there, and we built these houses, and it was awesome. And, and once we finished the houses, um, we, uh, we went and had kind of like a, a free day where we went to go shop at a market and eat real, authentic Mexican food, and it was amazing. I mean, gorditas do not taste like that at Taco Bell, I promise. <laughs> and so as we're walking around this, this very... Uh, very, very uh, Americanized, um, but yet still Mexican marketplace. There was this little kid, he was running around, he had this bandolier of batteries all wired together. And some of you guys know what I'm talking about. 
um, he, what he would do is he would give him a dollar, and then he would, he would come out and he would shake your hand, and he would shock the fire right out of you. And, and, and our, my kids would line up for a buck, so this kid, could, and he would shock them. Oh, I mean, it shocked them good, real good. It's kind of like, you know, around here, uh, if, if you grow up on a farm and you have a, have a, a city slicker come out and you have an electric fence, you, you, you play this game where you say, hey, hold my hand. And you grab that thing and it's fun, isn't it? I mean, if you've done it, you know it's fun. <laughs> but that's what they were doing. And so they were paying this kid a dollar every time he would shock them. And, and, and the kids would just, ah, and he would laugh. But then he would laugh harder when they gave him another dollar so they could do it again. And, and sometimes I feel like that's what we do when we fight the devil is that, is that we feel like we can do this on our own power. We can do this on our own strength. And we fail and we fall and we get the shock and we, we feel it. And then the, the opportunity comes again. And rather than plugging into our real source of power, we try to do it on our own again. And he just goes, all right, wham, and hits us one more time. Here's the reality. You don't have the power to fight him on your own. You're not supposed to. You're not supposed to. A lot of times what we do, rather than leaning into the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, the ultimate power, we tapped into a zap battery instead. A lot of us, when we face temptation, we feel the pressures of the world around us. We might know that God is a refuge we can run to, but that's not what we do. We call people who don't pray. We might even call church people who don't pray. We think it's maybe holy to talk about the problem, but we don't pray about the problem. We gossip about the problem, and then we compound our error. Or sometimes we, we don't even do that. Sometimes we just kind of hole up and we try to, this is what, what, what a lot of guys try to do. We just kind of try to man up and bring, it, bring us on through, you know. It's like, it's like when I was working on a construction site with my father-in-law, and he smashed, his, he smashed his hand with the sledgehammer. I said, you all right? Nope, I'm just fine. I mean, you could see blood pouring out of his glove. Are you okay? Yeah, I'm, I'm great. I'm, okay, I'm, you're great. You're bleeding all over the work site, but you're perfectly healthy, right? We do that, though. We do that all the time spiritually. And sometimes it's a pride issue, and sometimes it's just, I just don't know what to do issue. And my goal with this series is that we would try to kind of figure out how to tap in to that power. We learn how to fight. We learn how to resist. Because it doesn't come naturally. When I was a kid, I remember my, my grandpa, um, he brought this revivalist in, this kind of evangelist. And he was specifically focusing on some of the more occultic entertainment that was in our culture. Some of the music, some of the movies. And I was, I was a, a small child. I was, I was probably, well, I've actually never been a small child. Um, <laughs> Grandma liked to make me eat. Um, but I remember it was probably, it was probably nine or ten. And I, and I see these pictures and it became too much. And I got terrified. And I remember just in the middle of service, I ran out the back of the doors of the sanctuary and my grandpa's study was, was up in the uh, empty set of stairs. And I, I went and I hid on those stairs. And I was absolutely just bawling, scared. And I don't remember exactly what she said, but I remember my, my aunt, she followed me. She was just a few seconds behind me. And I don't remember what she said, but I do remember she loved me. And then she said this, Kelly, I, I want to teach you something. And I want you to hold on to this. And I'm going to say it in the King James because that's the way I learned it. She says, greater is he who's in you than he who's in the world. Now the full verse says it like this. It says, ye are of God, little children, and have overcame them. Not because you're amazing. Not because you're gifted. Not because you're special. But you have overcome because greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. See, we have access to the overcomer. We have access to the God of angel armies. In Christ, we're on the winning side. If you believe in Jesus, something has transpired. Something about you has changed. You have been adopted into the king, to the family of the king of kings. And because of him, you have already overcome. You have already won because of him. 
You didn't have to score the touchdown. You didn't have to throw the pass. You didn't have to pass the test. You overcome because he has already won. Can I get a round of applause? Because that's worth it. Greater is he who's within you than he who's within the world. That's why Paul gives us this specific instruction. Be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. In Christ, we fight from a position of victory, not for victory, of already won because he has overcome. And that's a huge difference. The tomb is empty. The battle has been won. And as long as we're in Christ, the victory is at hand. Now, the war may be over. The battle may be won, but there's still fighting going on. There's still this spiritual thing going on, this, this fight going on. Though. As we wait for Christ to come and bring his, his children home, there's still, there's still an enemy. And although... He's lost. He's in the death throes, and he's taken out as many people as he can, as fast as he can. On April 30th, 1945, Adolf Hitler came to his final conclusion. He had failed to gain all the power that he thought he could gain. And as the allies were surrounding him, getting ready to storm his headquarters like a coward... He poisoned his lover, Ava Braun, and he committed suicide with a gunshot. Now, immediately what happened after that was that the person who Hitler had handpicked to take his place, he immediately went out the next day and he told a harrowing story of how Hitler had died a hero defending the capital of the Third Reich. He told a story that made made Hitler out to be this brave man that he never was. And then the mass suicide started happening. Over 7,000 Germans followed Hitler in fear that the Allies were going to come in and treat them the way they had treated so many. The German army, um, even though their Fuhrer had died, they did not stop fighting. They continued to battle. In fact, they fought on until till May 9th, 1945, when they finally surrendered to the Russians. The war was over for all practical purposes, but the battles continued for over a week and thousands upon thousands of people died on both sides, either by the hand of the retreating Russian army or by their own hand in suicide. What I want you to hear this morning is that we have an enemy. He is a coward, but he will fight all the way to the end, which is why we have to lean on the power of God. Even as we have overcome, even as we have already been a part of this victory, we still need to put on the full army of God so that you'll be able to stand firm against the strategies of the devil. Paul tells us the devil has powerful strategies that bring us down. Next week I'm going to cover some of those strategies as we look more deeply into the way demons work in our world, in our lives. Um, I'm going to tell some things and some stories that I don't know I've ever told from the pulpit. Um, but some stories that I think you, may be helpful for some of us to understand the way our enemy works. What you need to understand is that, that the devil has strategies. He has schemes, and they're designed to make us fall. He, he's, he's not some, some enemy that's bumbling around the dark and just kind of just happening to throw certain things our way. The reality is, is, that, is that our enemy has been studying you. He's been studying your family for generations, watching you, putting things into place. That's why so much of the time, the thing that that was your father's problem has now become your problem. And if you look some, do some history as, as a counselor, I do a thing called a called a genogram. It's like a it's like a family tree on steroids. And what we'll do is we'll go back multiple generations, as many as the people can remember. And we'll identify well what, what were some patterns of behavior, what were some relationships like here, and it's it's amazing how you can go back and you can find addiction multiple generations it wasn't just the fact that that johnny got ran into some some bad friends 
But when we really start peeling back the layers, a lot of times what happens is, is that Johnny did run into some bad friends, but, but Dad had been hiding an alcohol addiction for years that we just didn't talk about. See, we have an enemy who has schemes and strategies that he uses against us. And he works to try to, to, try to make us fall. But here's the deal. When you read Scripture... It's very clear that we're not just supposed to stand there and take it. We're called to battle. We're called to put on that armor and get in the fight. There's this moment in Matthew 16, and it's one of my favorite moments, and I, and I say that a lot. It's one of my favorite moments in, in the book of Matthew. It's, it's whenever Jesus is teaching, he's talking to his people, and he, and, he, and he says to them, but who do you say that I am? It's a powerful question for any of us to ask and answer. Who do you say that I am? Simon Peter replied, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. And Jesus answered him, blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my father who is in heaven. And I tell you, and something changed here, something shifted. He says, and I tell you, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. There was power that was revealed, power that came down in Peter's life when he acknowledged that Jesus Christ was the Son of God. And then Jesus uses this curious language that I believe speaks to our role as a church. It says, on this rock I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Do you understand something when we read this? Gates are not offensive weapons. Gates are defensive structures. They are designed to keep people out or to protect something that is within. And when Jesus says this, that the gates of hell shall not prevail against the church, he's not saying that, that the gates of hell are going to come attacking us. It's the other way around. God put us on this planet, in this earth, for a purpose, for a reason. And it's to rescue all of his lost sons and daughters. We are the church, and we're to tear down the gates of hell. That's what we're supposed to do. So when we see injustice, we fight it. When we see evil, we fight it with love. We do it the right way. We follow God's instruction. We live in his power. But we stand against the things that bring so much pain and destruction in life. Why did he come, the thief? To steal, kill, and destroy. And we see it, do we not? All around us. Marriages that fail. Families. Businesses that fail. Much of the time because, because he's at work to steal, kill, and destroy. We see things all around us. The, the level of depression and mental illness. And I'm not, I'm, not trying to, to, to take, I'm not trying to take the genetic component of those things out. But I want to tell you something. There's, there is a spiritual battle that goes on there. The devil is here to steal, kill, and destroy. And every time we see that happening, it should cause something to stir up within us as the church that says, my God came for something bigger. My God came for something more. He loves us too much to let us stay in that mess. And we as the church are to rise up and be his hands and feet, to be his agents, and to storm those gates. Because victory is ours. Amen. Come on. One clap to everybody claps. The purpose of the church in this cosmic battle is not to sit in your pew and say amen like a church lady. <laughs> we are called to kick some butt and take some names in the name of Jesus Christ. That's the way it is. Which is why you need to be in a group. Which is why you need to get connected to other believers. Now, before we go any farther, I want to just speak to a very real and a very powerful issue that, that needs to be addressed. Because sometimes we have this tendency when we turn on the TV and we see news like we saw from last week. A gunman fires indiscriminately into a crowd of 20,000 people. A new record for the biggest mass homicide in the history of our nation. We look at those situations and we think, man, how, how evil does that person have to be? We remember just a week before that that there was a man who walks into a church in Nashville and he murders a lady who he went to church with, someone he knew and he shoots eight others. And we think, how is this possible? How does this happen? How evil are those people? 
What I want to say to you is that as we battle, we can't forget the back part of this verse. When Paul writes, for we battle not against flesh and blood. Man, it is so easy for us to see that and, and to put that up there. Put that scripture up there, please. For we are not fighting against flesh and blood enemies, but against evil rulers, authorities in this unseen world, against mighty powers in this dark world, against evil spirits in heavenly places. Now, I'm not, I'm not saying this to say that that man and those people, that they don't have their own responsibility. But I want to, I want to remind you what Paul is saying, what, what God's word says to us about this very thing. Is that these men and women that commit these acts, these atrocities, they are fighting the same spiritual battles that you and I fight. They just, they just fell. In the worst way, they fell. Now here's the reality. God called us to love our enemies, to pray for those who painfully and despitefully use us. Those are his words. And the ultimate end of that love is that we can bring them into the kingdom of God so their lives can be changed. Now see, here's why I think this is such an important thing for us to understand. That the man who wrote these words, the man who who wrote the words in 1 Corinthians 13 that are used in thousands and thousands and thousands of weddings every year, the man who wrote two-thirds of this New Testament that is so sacred and dear to us, before he became Paul, he was a man named Saul. And Saul was a terrorist. He hunted down Christians, people he knew. He knew their names, he knew their faces, he knew their families. That's why he was so good at what he did. And he tore families apart. He threw them in jail. Some he had killed. And yet he has this, this moment where he's on the road to Damascus. And he encounters Christ in such a powerful and profound way that he's forever changed. If we see those who are losing their battle with the enemy, and we hate them, then we rob the world of one of the most beautiful things that's grace that's the power of redemption a man named John Newton was a very very wild sailor he was out of control in many many ways and eventually found himself captaining a ship that had very lucrative cargo on it he was a slave trader he made many voyages across the Atlantic he made a lot of money buying and selling human beings. And then one night, as he's making a voyage, his ship is full, slaves and other cargo, and the storms begin to rage so powerfully and so strongly that it began to twist the hull of the ship and, and, and it actually caused a, a, giant, a giant hole to form there. Water was pouring in faster than they could bucket it out. And John Newton, not a believer, not a, not a faithful man, not a, not, a, not a good man, in every way, someone who would you describe as, as being evil. He prayed to God, he said, God, if you'll just save me and pull me out of this, I'll live my life for you. A lot of people pray that prayer. But when John Newton prayed it, the ship shifted. The cargo that he had, it lined right up against that hole. And it stemmed the flow of water until they could get that ship safely to shore. John Newton knew a miracle when he saw it. And as later he reflected on this life, he reflected on the, 
the vile nature of his participation in the slave trade. There's actually some of his testimony that William Wilberforce would use to end that awful atrocity in England. But as he thought about this God who would love him with everything that he had done, he penned the words to the song we're about to sing. A song that has become the most popular song in all the world, played, recorded more often than anything else. If you know the words, sing with us. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. song today is because I know there's a lot of us who though we may not be John Newton we wouldn't say we're winning the battles even though Christ has already won the war and maybe today you need a little grace because I'm going to tell you for the change to come that your family needs, for the change to come that your, your job needs, for the change to come that this community needs, it starts with you. Being willing to accept that grace for yourself. So this morning with every head bowed and every eye closed, I just want to do something. This morning I just want to ask this question. Which side are you on? Are you plugging into that power? The one who's won this battle? Are you still trying to fight this thing from your own strength? Are you in the battle fighting for others? Or are you kind of just doing this thing for you? How many of you guys would raise your hand this morning and say, Kelly, this morning I, I just want God to give me some of that grace because I messed up and I need it. Can I see your hand? My hand's up too. Heavenly Father, we pray right now that your grace will be given just as freely. Lord, as we open our mouths and say, Father, I need your touch. I need your hand. I'm asking for your grace to help me with all my weakness and to help me with all my failure. God, for some of us, we're going to be asking for grace to give us salvation. For some of us, we're going to be asking for grace to continue on. God, may our hearts and our minds be exactly where they need to be so we can be the people you've called us to be. For those of us that need salvation, Father, I pray right now we pray this prayer. Father, forgive me of my sin. Save this soul and be the Lord of my life. I believe you died and rose again for me. And because of that, I want to follow you. God, help us today to accept your forgiveness and to live in the power of your mercy and your love. We love you, Jesus. And we pray. Amen. Let's, let's sing this, the rest of this song, and as we kind of close the service today, let's sing it as loud as we can. Come on, Nathan. We've been there ten thousand years, bright shining as the sun. We have no less days to sing God's praise than when.
God, go with us. Father, help us to leave in your power and your strength. And God, may we walk only the paths you lead us down. Grace and peace. Have a wonderful Sunday.